When do we actually use jets? I'm Dr. Tala and this is the second video on the jet ventilator. If you haven't seen the first one, then go back and watch it now. This really isn't gonna mean a lot to you unless you see that one, or unless you know jets, which is then why are you watching this? So today we're gonna go over three things. One, clinical scenarios in which we use the jet. Two, the kind of starting settings that we use when we put babies on the jet. And three, how do we titrate the jet under different clinical scenarios, using that phrase twice. Before we go on, I just want to say that this is not a sponsored video, but we got a lot of educational materials from Bunel that make the jet. So thank you so much, Carrie Neville especially. Let's start with one. When do we use the jet ventilator in the NICU? Well, the fantastic thing about the jet is that it uses kind of like a different mechanism of gas exchange. So because of that, we can support babies by still using lower pressures and rates and tidal volumes. And so the hope is, is that it's a lot less damaging to baby's lungs. Anyone who works in the NICU or has watched any of these videos knows how completely obsessed we are with preventing further injury to baby's lungs. So what we're really trying to do is prevent chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. If you want to learn more about that, go watch the BPD video. As you all know, baby's lungs are developing all the way up to 40 weeks, really way beyond the 40 weeks. And at 22 weeks, babies don't really even have their alveolar sacs. And then at about 24 weeks, we start seeing the sacs and there's an acceleration in lung development as well as growth. So we have two huge problems. How do we actually give them the support that they need when their lungs are so immature? But also how do we do it in a way that prevents as little damage as possible in lungs that still have a lot of growth and development to be done? So our hope is that when we put babies on the high frequency ventilators or the jet, that we are doing as little damage to the lungs as possible and supporting them in a very gentle way. Like the oscillator, we think about how we use the jet in two different ways. So the first one is, like we said, in premature babies, to try to give them the support with as little damage as possible. And the second way that we use the jet is more as kind of a rescue ventilator. So let's say a baby, even a full-term baby, is on the conventional vent and they've maxed out on their FiO2 or their CO2 is through the roof and we've maxed out on the settings then we can try to put the babies on the jet, hoping that a different mechanism of gas exchange will actually improve their ventilation and oxygenation. So what sort of evidence we actually have for using jets in these scenarios? Well, ridiculously, after about 40 years of using these machines, we really still don't have a lot of conclusive evidence. A lot of this could be like everything else in neonatology, that it's just really difficult to prove a lot. A lot of the units do things slightly differently. There are a lot of other different practices involved that maybe it's not just the ventilator that's going to determine survival and the rates of the BPD. What published data seems to be showing is that each unit, whichever machine they use, should be using that machine as well as possible and as gently as possible while still supporting the baby to have the great BPD and survival outcome. So using very gentle ventilation, the lowest support possible, extubating when they can, having weaning protocols in place, all these good practices that will help the numbers in any individual unit, no matter what machine they're using. There are three international units or systems that are publishing absolutely fantastic survival rates in 22 and 23 weekers. And interestingly, all of them use different modes of ventilation. In Sweden, they use volume guaranteed modes on conventional ventilators, even these tiny babies. In Japan, they start the babies on volume guarantee modes. And then if the babies fail that, then they'll put the babies on the oscillator. So another type of high frequency ventilator. In the US, the best survival numbers are probably coming out of Iowa. And they recently published that about 78% of their 22 and 23 weekers survive. In Iowa, they do put these babies on the jet. So clearly they must be doing something pretty right. 
Another super recent study came out of Boston by Rallis et al. And basically they just looked back at their jet use versus their conventional ventilator use in tiny premature babies over the last few years. The average gestational age in the study was about 25 weeks. And what they found was that really when the babies were smaller and sicker, they were much more likely to be placed on the jet ventilators. And when they teased out the numbers, they found that especially for these tiny, sicker babies, so babies that had a higher OI, babies that were on presses or whatever, their survival was much better and their chance of developing BPD was much lower if the babies were actually placed on the jet versus the conventional ventilator. So in the US at least, maybe there is some kind of slightly solid evidence moving towards jet usage for these tiny babies. Obviously, again, this really depends a lot on the unit, on everybody's experience, on the number of tiny premature babies that you actually have in your unit. Two, now let's talk about some kind of initial settings if you're putting a baby on the jet. So again, obviously this is really unit dependent. So I'm mostly gonna talk about kind of what we do. Iowa also publishes its settings online. And so I've kind of tried to incorporate a little bit of that as well. So just like all ventilators, we always want to use the minimum amount of support that we can give that will still oxygenate and ventilate the babies. And generally, the smaller and the younger the baby, then generally the lower all the settings. So the lower the rate, the lower the PIP, the lower the PEEPs. So for example, if you have a baby less or equal to 24 weeks, then you'd probably start on a rate of about 300, a PEEP of five, a PIP for the jet in the high teens, maybe 20, and an eye time of 0.02 seconds. Obviously, after putting the infant on the jet, you constantly have to be monitoring the infant. So with gases, with the FiO2, with the X-ray, with the work of breathing. So on the X-ray, we want the ribs to be kind of seven, nine ribs expanded. We don't definitely don't want flattened diaphragms. So for example, if you get an X-ray after you put the baby on the jet and the ribs are really hypo expanded, so you're only kind of like, you know, at six ribs and your FiO2 is at 60%, then the first thing that you'd want to do is go up on the PEEP. So generally we go up on the PEEP at kind of one at a time. So maybe you'd go from five to six. When you do put the baby on the jet, then you want to see a good jiggle. And the jiggle indicates the amount of tidal volume that's going into the lungs. So if you don't have a good jiggle on the jet, then you want to go up on the PIP which like we said, if you watch the first video, increases the tidal volume. So even before you get a gas, if you put the baby on the jet and say you put the baby on a PIP of 18, say it's a 22, 23 weeker, and the baby doesn't have a jiggle at all, then you can creep up slightly, maybe by one or two on the PIP, hoping to see a bigger jiggle on the baby. As the baby gets older and larger, then your starting settings are going to start with a slightly higher rate. So maybe for a 26 weeker, you might start at a rate of 360 and a 28, 29 weeker, you might start at a rate of 420. If you are switching a baby over from a conventional vent onto the jet, then use the PIP that you had on the conventional vent as the starting point for your PIP on the jet. Then, like we said, you put the baby on the jet and if there isn't a good wiggle, then go up more on that PIP. Then if you happen to have an air leak, so you have a pneumothorax or PIE, which we see unfortunately a little too commonly in these tiny, tiny babies, then what you want to do is decrease the pressure that the babies are seeing as much as possible. So go down on the PEEP, even if it means that you need a slightly higher FiO2, go down on the PIP on the jet as well. The other thing that you can do is go down on the rate. And generally you'd want to go down by about 20 to 60 beats per minute. So let me explain why this is important for babies with PIE. Remember, like we said in the first video, that with a fixed eye time, when you go down on the rate, then basically each total breath cycle lasts a little bit longer. And with a fixed eye time, that basically means that you've got more time for expiration or more time to get rid of the gas or get rid of the CO2. So when you go down on the rate, then you have a much lower chance of actually gas trapping 
in the alveoli. And so more of that gas is exhaled, which will obviously result in less pressure and hopefully allow the PIE to resolve or the pneumothorax to heal. And we already alluded to this, when do you actually use the side breaths or the recruitment breaths? So again, if a baby's FiO2 is creeping up, you get an x-ray and you see that there's just like patchy atelectasis. So just areas of collapse throughout the lungs and you want to try to pop open those lungs again. Then you can use the conventional ventilator to actually give a few breaths. Normally we only do that up to about five breaths a minute. Sometimes we can go even higher than that. Remember though, that those breaths are being delivered in its entirety to the baby's lungs. There's no pressure attenuation. So they are not gentle breaths at all. So even if you are going to use that, that is not something that we want to use continuously. Maybe you'll put the side breaths on for the night or for a few hours to try to pop open those lungs. So like we said, we do it at about a rate of up to about five breaths per minute. And then you'll use pretty much the same PEEP that you've got the baby on anyway. And then your PIP should be lower than the PIP on the jet. Normally we do a PIP about 10 higher than the PEEP on the conventional vent. Right, let's go through number three. Let's go through a couple of clinical scenarios and how we actually fix them on the jet. So let's say that we get this gas. It is 7.12, 353. And let's say that the baby is a one week old X24 weaker who's just kind of been chugging along on the jet. So the first thing I want to say is that this baby is only one week old. So obviously if this baby was like a 39 week baby and you got 72 on a cap gas, you might not be jumping all over it with permissive hypercarbia and whatever. But a one week old baby a 72 CO2 is way too high. So we want that CO2 to go down. We want to improve ventilation on the baby. So like we already said, what is the variable that we change the most to affect ventilation on the jet? Yes, the PIP on the jet, because as you all know, the PIP will improve the tidal volume. So the first thing that we would do is go up on the PIP in increments of like one to two. If your PIP on the jet is getting super high, like in the 30s, remember though that that PIP is not being seen by the alveoli because of all the attenuation. Still, you don't really want PIPs on the jets higher than the 30s, especially in these tiny babies. Then after kind of going up a little bit on the PIP, you really do have to start considering other factors if your CO2 is still elevated. So another thing that we can do is go up on the rate. And normally when we do go up on the rate, we're going up by like 60 beats per minute. Sometimes we go up by a little bit less than that if the babies are super sensitive. This does also have its downside because remember, every time you go up on the rate, it also means that you're going down on the time of expiration. So you also just have to be very aware of that. Then just like on the conventional ventilator, you could also decrease the peep. Remember that the tidal volume being delivered is a function of the delta P. So the difference between the PIP being given by the jet and the PEEP being given by the conventional ventilator. So if you go down on the PEEP, then obviously that's gonna be a bigger difference and provide a bigger tidal volume. So theoretically, you could also go down on a PEEP. That could be a situation where you're like hyper expanded as well as you have like very good oxygenation. The other thing that you can change is the eye time or the inspiratory time. So remember from the first video that we said that increasing the eye time will actually increase the tidal volume. So by going up on the eye time, you will actually improve, increase your tidal volume. So really should improve the ventilation. Again, this is tied up with the trickiness with the rate as well, because as you're going up on the eye time, you are by definition going down on your time for expiration if you are keeping the rate exactly the same. So it can be a little bit tricky. Sometimes you could go up a little bit on the eye time and instead the CO2 actually goes even higher just because you've given less time for expiration. So just be aware of that. The eye time and the rate uh, can be super, super sensitive, but theoretically going up on the eye time and going up on the rate should, if you've given the baby enough time for expiration, should improve ventilation. 
So sometimes you just have to kind of play around with all these things. As you all know, there's a lot of trial and error in medicine until you can find exactly the rate and the eye time that like gives you the perfect amount of ventilation. Okay, second scenario, let's say that you go to the baby's bedside in the morning when you're about to start rounds and you see that the baby's satting in the mid 70s. And what are your options? So obviously the baby's oxygen is too low. The first thing that we can do while we're figuring everything out is to go up on the FiO2. If this has been a huge change, then you might want to get an X-ray and a gas just to kind of see how well expanded are we? Are there areas of atelectasis that we need to try to pop open? Is this a pure hypoxemic thing or do we also have bad ventilation? Is our CO2 90 as well and we need to move everything else around? But we know that when a baby isn't getting the oxygen they need on the jet, there are a few things that we can improve. The first thing that we can do is go up on the PEEP. Like we said, this is the biggest contributor to the mean airway pressure. So you can go up on the PEEP by one or two, especially if the X-ray shows that you're hypo expanded. You can also go up on the PIP on the jet. And this also does contribute, not as much as the PEEP, but it does contribute to the mean airway pressure. And this is the first thing that we would do as well if the CO2 is also elevated. If we get the x-ray and there are areas of atelectasis, then like we keep saying, we can start some side breaths or some recruitment breaths as well. And then you can play around with a pip and the eye time on the actual conventional ventilator breaths. Clinical scenario three. What if your CO2 is a little bit elevated, so 68, 69, and you get an x-ray and you are super hyper expanded? Well, if you just get a high CO2 and you don't know what's going on in the lungs, then maybe what you try to think about doing is actually going up on the pit. But if you are super expanded, hyper expanded, then really what could be happening is that there's actually some level of gas trapping. So the air is going in and we're not being able to get that CO2 out. So counterintuitively, this is kind of one of those scenarios where you might actually want to come down on the pressures. So come down on the peak, come down on the pit. Then, because you want to give more time to get that CO2 out, then you might actually decrease the rate and you might decrease the eye time. You don't have to do both of those, but both decreasing the eye time as well as decreasing the rate will lengthen the period of each of those breaths and therefore increase the amount of time for exhalation. So those are all the things that you could do if the lungs are super hyper expanded. Okay, again, I think that was a lot of information. If you learn anything from this video, then please like it. And then also when you comment to us, will you please tell us where you're from? We've got a map and we're trying to fill it in with every NICU in the world, hopefully from viewers all over the world. Again, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it.